56 degrees. A gospel song that says we're going down the river one by one. We're heading toward the setting of the sun. But A.G. Hobbs, a valiant uh, servant of the Lord, passed away uh, in his 80s. I guess he's the only brother that uh, ever circulated at least one million tracks. You might remember his little blue series of tracks that went all over the world. And his funeral will be tomorrow at 3 at Hanley. But uh, he did an awful lot of good. I was talking to Dillard Thurman today, and he'll be 80 years old in about two weeks. And I believe he has spread the gospel more than any one person that I know, other than maybe Brother Brownlow, through the Gospel Minutes, a periodical that he has been editing since about 1955. I've been writing for that since 1960, so I know he's been going longer than 31 years. And uh, just think of the hundreds of thousands and millions and millions of people that he has taught through the print page. We owe a great debt of gratitude to men like that, and Brother Guy in Wood, who's about 80 now, who's written a lot of great material, has edited the Gospel Advocate in days past, still answers Bible questions in that. We owe a debt of gratitude to those pioneers and those who went before and paved the way. <laughs> we have some great questions tonight. Turn to Ephesians 2.12 for our first one. Ephesians 2.12 describes the Gentiles in time past as being without Christ, strangers from the covenant of promise, without hope and without God in the world. This passage seems to indicate that the Gentiles were an evil and corrupt people living under no covenant. Would you please elaborate on this particular passage? Now keep your place in Ephesians 2, and we are elaborating on that passage by giving you a background passage that sheds some light on the wording. Turn now back to the Old Testament to an almost unknown book, 2 Chronicles chapter 15. 2 Chronicles 15. You're going to find the exact same teaching as referred to the Gentiles in Ephesians 2 in the first century back in 2 Chronicles 15, speaking to the Jews, to God's own people, Abraham's seed, his special people. Therefore, I conclude that uh, when you consider both passages, he's simply making a statement that anyone who turns his back upon God at any time is without God and without hope in the world. Now, let's read, and I think you'll see how clear-cut this background is. It's as though Paul reaches back here and borrows this language in the first century. Verse 1 of 2 Chronicles 15. And the Spirit of God came upon Azariah, the son of Obed, and went out to meet Asa and said unto him, Hear ye me, Asa, and all Judah and Benjamin. The Lord is with you while you be with him. And if you seek him, he will be found of you. But if ye forsake him, he will forsake you. Now he's speaking to the ruler and to the people of Judah and Benjamin, God's elect. Now for a long season, verse 3 says, Now for a long season Israel hath been without the true God and without a teaching priest and without law. But when they in their trouble did turn unto the Lord God of Israel and sought him, he was found of them. And in those times there was no peace to him that went out nor to him that came in, the great vexation were upon all the inhabitants of the countries. I notice, but when they in their trouble did turn unto the Lord God of Israel and sought him, he was found of them. So without hope, without God in the world is dependent upon man's own action, whether it be Jew or Gentile. In the first century, under the gospel age, or in ancient centuries, a thousand years before Christ, during the Mosaical institution or the patriarchal regime. Therefore, Ephesians 2 is simply stating that anyone who is unreconciled, anyone who has not embraced the gospel, anyone who is not covered by the blood of Christ is without hope, without God in the world. In fact, the thing that always amazes me in Ephesians 2, 1, in that very same chapter, he begins by saying, you were dead in trespasses and sins. Now let me give you a perfect parallel in another writing of Paul. In Romans chapter 1, beginning of verse 18 and going to the end of the chapter in Romans 1, he lists the sins of the Gentiles. He says they do not like to retain God in their knowledge. God gave them up to reprobate minds. They worship and serve the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. And he begins to tell of all the despicable things the Gentiles in the first century were guilty of, and they were far afield from God. But immediately in chapter 2, he turns to the Jews and says, you're inexcusable too because you do the same things you condemn the Gentiles for. 
And in chapter 3, he'll say, And you have less excuse, for unto you the oracles of God were committed. Thou that teachest another, teachest thou not thyself? And then he says, A man is not a Jew who is one outwardly. And now notice the climactic summation in chapter 3 of Romans. In the first century, written by Paul, who wrote Ephesians. In chapter 3, he says, There is none righteous, no, not one. He's speaking universally. Jew or Greek. There's none righteous, no, not one. There is no fear of God before their eyes. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So they were without hope, without God in the world in the first century, both Jew and Gentile, because they chose to walk apart from him. But we have a few brethren, and one is a dozen too many. We have a few brethren today who are going around using Ephesians 2 out of context with no reference back to 2 Chronicles 15 and saying that from the time God gave the law at Sinai to the Jews, he dismissed the Gentiles from his memory, from his plan of redemption, and they were as good as zero. They didn't exist. And they're all setting this up in order to teach that those outside of Christ aren't answerable to God's marriage laws. But marriage came centuries before Christianity, and it was ordained of God. And men were married in God's sight before the gospel was ever preached on Pentecost. And God's marriage laws apply to everybody just alike. <laughs> I'll tell you a good question. I ask one of these fellows who teaches that God's marriage laws do not apply to the non-Christian. And we have a strange phenomenon in many homes where one is a Christian and the other isn't. And yet they claim to be married. You mean the non-Christian isn't married? The Christian just thinks he's married? If God's marriage laws don't apply to all mankind, then how about in a marriage where one's a Christian one isn't? Is one married and the other not married? One answerable to God's marriage law. How would you like to be married to somebody that wasn't uh, under God's marriage law? Strange, strange argumentation. Let me tell you something. About uh, 10 years ago, the brother who has made a hobby out of this point, that's all he ever talks about, that God blacked out the Gentiles once he gave the law at Sinai to the Jews. He quoted Ephesians 2, and in front of 60 or 70 Preachers and elders up at Denton at a lunch one day, they asked me to debate him. I said, I won't debate a brother, but I'll discuss the scriptures with anybody. So after he had made his point, I said, have you never read Second Chronicles 15? And we turned there. And that pretty well settled it for the day. That what he's saying is exclusively for the Gentiles in Ephesians 2 was said to the Jews in Second Chronicles 15. And I said to him that day, I said, there's no way you can continue to teach this heresy and not fall into Brother Bale's heresy on marriage, divorce, remarriage. He was incensed. He said, you have no right to say that. And I said, that's the logical end of your argument. About a month ago, he came out with a paper that makes Brother Bale's look like a sissy. I mean, he's way even beyond Brother Bale's position on marriage, divorce, remarriage. There's no way you can hold that view. And I'll tell you again, the reason that there couldn't be any truth to that is in the first two chapters of Amos, Eight centuries before Christ, Amos, God's prophet, speaks to about a half a dozen Gentile nations and tells them they've transgressed God's law. And sin is transgression of God's law, 1 John 3, 4. So if they transgress God's law, they had to be under his law in order to transgress it. And that takes care of that argument. That was several hundred years after the law of Moses was given to the Jews at Mount Sinai. And the book of Jonah. Here's Nineveh, a leading Gentile city. Here's God's prophet preach. And they don't only understand it, they repent of their sins and God forgives them. So without hope, without God in the world. For instance, there are a lot of people who have been baptized into Christ in days past, added to the church, were faithful for a good while, now out in apostasy. They're without hope, without God in the world. As long as we're in that condition. That's the whole point that he's making. <laughs> That's a good question because it enlightens us on some other things. Galatians 5.18, what does being led by the Spirit mean? How are we so led by the Spirit? And Ephesians chapter 5, beginning with verse 16 and going to the end of the chapter, vividly contrasts what it means to walk after the Spirit and after the flesh. He lists the works of the flesh and the fruit of the Spirit. And we're capable of performing or producing either, one to our condemnation, the other to our justification under the grace of God. But before and after he lists the works of the flesh and the fruit of the Spirit, he mentions we are led by the Spirit. How are we led by the Spirit? 
I don't know of a single solitary way we can know for sure we're led by the Spirit unless we're doing what the Bible teaches. The sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. I do believe the Bible teaches the Holy Spirit dwells in the Christian. There are too many passages that teach that, like uh, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, and Romans 8, 11 through 14, 1 Thessalonians 2, 4 to 8, and 1 John 3, 24, and so forth. The Bible clearly teaches the Holy Spirit dwells in the Christian. But being led by the Spirit, I know of no way that men are led by the Spirit, but by the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. It's not some hocus-pocus, better felt than told atmosphere that surrounds us that we can't comprehend. The sword of the Spirit is the Word of God, Ephesians 6, 17. How are we led by the Spirit? By the teachings of the Spirit. My Father's teaching led me through life and still dwells in me, if you please. I can still remember as though it were yesterday, and it's been 11 years and a half since we put him in the ground, his body in the ground. I remember vividly what he told me taught me. And nearly every good thing I do is a result of my dad's teaching. And I believe the way we're led by the Holy Spirit is by following his teachings. There are some people who used to teach that uh, uh, they've kind of died down on it. But uh, when the Holy Spirit mania began about 20 years ago, we had brethren who really, quote, got religion, unquote. And they'd say the Holy Spirit tapped me on the shoulder and told me to go down to the end of that street and turn right and go three blocks and go to a housing area and go to the middle of the block, the yellow house, and go upstairs and on the third apartment apartment door knock and there'd be someone there ready for me to teach the gospel to. Well, I know there's something wrong with that because Jesus said the field is the world and one soul is good as another. And how about all those houses between where he started and where he got, how about the lost souls in all those other apartments, all those other houses? Why not just say the Bible teaches me to preach the gospel to every creature and every nation at the end of time as I have opportunity? That encompass all this foolishness. Eh? We've got too many religious groups now saying they were called of God or the Holy Spirit told them this or that, but God's not the author of confusion, 1 Corinthians 14, 33. And the only way that he will continue not to be a God of confusion is for each accountable person to follow the message he has in the book. Been in the Bible all this time. I don't know of anyone that could prove that they were led by the Spirit other than the thus saith the Lord, the message of the Holy Spirit. In the light, and this is a great question, in light of the admonition to honor your father and mother, is this an unconditional rule or are parents who live ungodly lives to be shunned like anyone else who walks disorderly? You remember when George Wallace was running as an independent candidate for the presidency of the United States and Outside Baltimore one day, his uh, political career was cut short by an assassin's bullet. But Wallace didn't die, though he has lived, uh, he lived in much, much pain for many years. But uh, to everyone's surprise, in a wheelchair, he came in a tuxedo to the presidential inauguration of one of the opponents he was running against. And what he had spoken against pretty strongly, as you know, he didn't know but one way to speak and that strongly. And whether you liked his politics or not, you had to admire his gumption. But I never will forget this uh, television reporter putting the microphone down low there in that wheelchair to Mr. Wallace and saying, I'm surprised you're here. Why are you here? He said, I come not to honor the man, but the office. You see, one of the darkest days of my life was the day John F. Kennedy was president of the United States because I believe he was an immoral man. He also was subject to a foreign leader, the Pope, uh, as a Catholic and so forth. But in Adelaide, Australia, that Sunday morning after the news came 10,000 miles away that against all hope he was president of the United States, I prayed for him because First Timothy 2 tells me to. I honored the office. Romans 13 tells me to. First Peter 2 says, honor the king. First Peter 2, 17. Now, from that standpoint, yes, we should honor our parents. They brought us into the world. But the best way we can honor our parents who are lost is to teach them the truth. See, instead of being dishonorable by pressing the gospel upon them, we're showing we love them and honor them as human beings more than any other way. Oh, we don't respect their infidelity, their immorality, their lack of Christ-likeness, and we tell them so. But we try to teach them so they'll be converted and come to the Lord. Brother Joe Malone was raised a Roman Catholic, a strong, devout one. His family deeply resented when he obeyed the gospel of Christ. 
And then when he began to preach, they were beside themselves. Uh, one of his greatest joys was finally one day, about a year and a half before she died, baptizing his mother into Christ. I was at his mother's funeral, and uh, I've never seen uh, such a sweet and sad day both together. But how grateful he was he could put that body in the grave there as one converted to Christ. He honored his mother by not obeying her when she said stay with Romanism. He honored her by teaching her the truth. But we can have respect for people who bring us into the world, and we should. And a lot of times this gives us a golden opportunity to obey uh, Romans 12 and return good for evil. And Matthew 5, love our enemies. So well, sometimes those of our own household, Jesus said, will become our enemies. Matthew 10 and Luke 14. We should never honor anybody who's sinful. We should never honor anybody who disobeys God and flaunts the grace of God and laughs at the kingdom of God. But we should honor them for what they did do and for the fact they have a soul and get busy trying to convert them and at least know that we made every effort when our life comes to an end or theirs do and we stand over their casket or they over ours that we have honored them by sharing the gospel with them whether they obeyed it or not. In fact, sometimes I've seen it happen that uh, parents who were unkind and uh, to their children and didn't teach them the truth and lived in a vagabond way have been melted by the devotion and love of children they didn't treat right and teach right who would sit at their bedside in the hospital or rest home hour after hour, day after day, week after week. And that honoring of a relationship that goes all the way back to the beginning of the home, the family, can really open people's eyes to the things that count. We should never, ever compromise with kin folks, whether it's father, mother, son, or daughter, husband, or wife. Jesus said, if you do, you're not worthy of me. But there is a way that we can balance all of these things. And I believe that's the point. <laughs> I believe that I started to answer this one time and we ran out of time. I know I've said a word or two about it in sermons and maybe in here on a different question. But I'm, I wouldn't have it in my little deal if I, I usually put those away when I feel like I said everything I need to say on it. When Jesus said, upon this rock, I will build my church, what is this rock? Of course, the Roman church says it's Peter. But uh, I mentioned that that was a play on words, really, because uh, uh, he uses two different words. I say unto you that you are Peter, Petros, and upon this Petra, I will build my church. You remember the first time Jesus met Peter, John 1, He said, you'll be known as Cephas, which meaneth a stone, a small pebble. Peter made the confession, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, and Jesus is saying in a contrasting, uh, contradistinction, you might even say, converse statement. You're a small pebble, but upon this bedrock, ledge rock, solid foundation you've uttered that I am the Christ, it's upon that rock that I'll build my church. In 1 Corinthians 10, 4, though the setting is different, it's interesting that it says, and to that rock, which is Christ. But in 1 Corinthians 3.11, Paul said, Other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So the foundation of Christianity is not Simon Peter. Jesus didn't ask in the coast of Caesarea Philippi that day, 19 centuries ago, who is Peter? He said, whom do men say that I am? And Peter answered. In uh, Acts 4.11 and 12, Peter takes it out of the realm of conjecture. He knew he wasn't a rock. He said, Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone. And you, the Jewish builders, have rejected the chief cornerstone and their salvation and none other but him. How can you build a solid foundation of spiritual housing when you leave out the rock, the foundation stone? In Isaiah 28, 16, we read of this rock. And those who believe or trust in him shall not be made afraid, shall not be put to flight, shall not be ashamed. Isaiah 28, 16. And then Peter really sums it up in 1 Peter 2, 5 to 7. And then in the last part of that chapter 2, verse 25, when he says that Christ is the chief cornerstone and we are living stones built upon him as a solid spiritual habitation unto God. And then the very last verse of 1 Peter 2, he calls Christ the bishop and shepherd of our faith. The Romans say Peter was the first bishop of Rome. Peter says Christ is the bishop. Isn't it amazing they have the Pope arguing with the Pope? If indeed he were the Pope. 
which they could have made a lot better pulp out of Paul than Peter, because Paul rebuked Peter to his face, and the apostles sent Peter and John, not Peter sent them, and so many other passages. We mentioned the other day the purpose of miracles, but there was one part we didn't have time for. I wish you'd get your pencils out here. Uh, you need these notes. This is most helpful when you're talking to Pentecostal people who think the purpose of miracles is to have a good time and uh, so forth, and that it's something that continues to put coffers in the pockets of Pentecostal preachers and build cathedrals and so forth. Here are three classic illustrations to prove that miracles were not used in the first century capriciously for personal gain, that they were used to confirm the word, and when that would not be done, they were not used. For instance, in 2 Corinthians 12, the first nine verses, the greatest Christian on earth in the first century, if anyone should have expected a miracle on his behalf, it was this great Christian Paul. But in 2 Corinthians 12, he said, I had a thorn in the flesh, and I besought the Lord over and over again to remove it. And he said, no. Well, the purpose of miracle is to make people feel good and to help Christians and to be a display of the power of God. That didn't make sense. But if the purpose of miracle was to confirm the word, they were not to be used selfishly. In 1 Timothy 5, the best friend Paul had on earth, Timothy, his son in the gospel, the one who was dearer to him than anybody else on earth, had a stomach ailment. Paul could have healed him just like that, but he didn't. He gave even an, a medicinal remedy, though he could have healed him, had the power to. But the purpose of miracles wasn't for personal aggrandizement or special favors for friends. And then here may be the best one. That's 1 Timothy 5, 23. 2 Timothy 4, 20. Of a gospel preacher mentioned elsewhere in the Bible, Paul said, Tropimus have I left at my leadum sick. You know where Tropimus was from? Ephesus. You know where my leadum was? 15 miles from Ephesus, the seacoast village. But Paul, who had the power to heal this gospel preacher, instantly left him 15 or 20 miles from home, sick. So the purpose of miracles wasn't for selfish, personal usage. It was to confirm the word. I guess we might ask why was only Lazarus raised at that graveyard outside Bethany. Why didn't he raise everybody? See, that did prove that what Jesus taught was confirmed by a miracle. A very special miracle, if you please. He had been dead long enough that his body stinketh. Read John 11. Jesus purposely waited till he died, though Lazarus was his friend and could have kept him from dying and healed him so he wouldn't have died. And he didn't raise everybody in the graveyard. He only raised Lazarus. Does that prove his point? That he was what he claimed to be. So a capricious usage of miracles never found even in the New Testament. <laughs> A few Sunday evenings ago in the closing prayer, the brother prayed for angels, even mentioned a few by name. Is this scriptural? If so, what do we pray for angels for? For the forgiveness of sins? Please explain. If this practice is not scriptural, was the brother admonished concerning this? Well, number one, I know the prayer you talk about and the person you talk about. I also listened very, very carefully, and he didn't pray for angels to do anything. He just thanked the Lord for Gabriel and Michael and one unnamed one. And angels are found all over the Old Testament. Now, had he said we're thankful for the work they do in saving sinners, or but Michael and Gabriel are the predominant angels mentioned in the Old and New Testament. Michael nearly always deals with death, and Gabriel with birth. And the brother didn't indicate angels did anything at all. He just thanked the Father for the Father, for the Son, for the Holy Spirit, and for angels. I don't believe there's anything wrong with that prayer. I, it is unusual. I've never heard it before in all my life. But I do not believe that he went beyond that. Uh, it may just be a, an extreme expression of gratitude for all the help and all the blessings and all the workings of God through the years. And if nothing else, I'm sure it made us all think. I know my wife and I discussed that on the way home. It was different. And again, I do not remember one single thing said that indicated that uh, he was thanking angels for forgiving sins or doing any other such thing. 
Now here is an interesting question. And the thing that makes this very interesting is there is no possible absolute answer. But this is an interesting question to make us think and to send us down many good hours of study. Uh, to what limits, if any, should we stay within when we build and decorate our buildings, our church buildings? I do believe that the Bible does teach conservatism concerning material things. Do therefore the elaborate uh, cathedrals of Romanism, and uh, is that out? However, what is too much? What image should our buildings project? I imagine that somewhere in our lifetime, if we've been members of church very long, we've come across discussions of where's the authority for church buildings? What's the limitations concerning them? How much should we invest in them? Who has the right to decide? Where does judgment enter in and extravagance uh, enter in? And what is the standard? I'm now going to just discuss a few things for us to think about. Number one, it's interesting that in the New Testament, when we read of the church meeting anywhere, it was either in a public place like the temple until the Jews caught on that this is an insurrection movement against us. Uh, then they went to private dwelling places like the rented hall in Acts chapter 20, the upper room. Uh, and also in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 16, Romans chapter 16, and Colossians chapter 4, in the first few verses of the book of Philemon, we read the phrase, and to the church in their house, that meets in their house, usually Ananias uh, or uh, Aquila and Priscilla, who were tent makers and would naturally have a larger place to meet because of the very nature of their work, which Paul accompanied them in. In other words, the emphasis in the New Testament is not on cathedrals or buildings, brethren on, it's really on uh, meeting in rented halls and uh, very unadorned and the history tells us they met in caves, catacombs, and so forth. I met some brethren in Australia that I didn't know we had, and they didn't know they had. Uh, an independent movement in uh, Poland is where they were from, and not the movement we thought we found a few years ago, but one they said was much more conservative than that. And they said for 100 years we met in barns and said we've had as many as three and 400 people in a congregation. And so we've done real well. I can say this personally in Australia, in Adelaide, Australia, which had 800,000 people in it when we lived there, now has a million people. We did as well without a building 26, 30, 26, 29 years ago as they've done since with buildings. We had his large attendance and his fervent work. The emphasis of the New Testament is not on real estate. We might as well face it. It's on the Great Commission, on getting the gospel to every creature in every, in every nation. Now, is it wrong then to own buildings? No, because the Bible would be binding if we said that. But is it spiritual imbalance when brethren nearly everywhere have a huge building debt emphasizing something the New Testament doesn't and is in arrears on world evangelism, which we're commanded to do, and which is the heart of Christianity. And when brethren who want to go to Toronto and Timbuktu and they're told we're paying our building out and don't have any funds for you, we've got the Great Commission upside down. Now, having said all that, I was never so surprised in my life, and I'm throwing this out just for you to think about. I was invited to perhaps the best known and reputation strongest congregation in the state of Alabama. A brother well known to many had preached there for over four decades. He was dead by that uh, time I was invited to come. I've been back several times since. And it amazed me when I stepped in that auditorium and over the baptistry was the largest cross and it was uh, leaning like this, clear over the baptistry. Uh, that's foreign to my concept. Uh, I would not have done that. Can I say that was wrong? No. Nope. Did I say the motivation was wrong? Certainly not. Just a different view of matters. Whose judgment allowed that to be put there? The elders of that congregation. And they oversee that flock. And they sign their names on a bill of goods down at the bank, too, for many, many years to come. We've got to realize when the final analysis comes, though we can have some input on emphasis and the urgency of the gospel, how large a building, whether it has benches, pews, opera chairs, whatever, carpet or not, 
what color or not matters of judgment. And we don't want to get uh, sidetracked. However, there is another element that enters in. And this has to just be between people and the Lord. I'm not saying I am judging anybody, though if I thought there was a definite Bible principle, I'd speak out. But what do we spend the Lord's money for? Why will we go to a bank or a building institution and willingly borrow millions of dollars for a building and then fix it up elaborately while the souls of men are dying and we haven't gone to the bank to borrow anything for world evangelism? And here's the main point. What prompts us to build the building with it? The ornate cathedrals. Is it pride? Is it social poise in a community? Do we really think we could ever convert anybody, really convert someone to Christ because of the way a building looked? Where did we ever get that idea? The gospel is God's power to say. Romans 1.16. We're entering in now to some principles that ought to guide us and sustain us. Well, we've got to have a building as good as the Baptist Methodist or nobody would come here. You mean we don't have the gospel to draw people who are honest and sincere? We've got to bribe people, entice people when the gospel is God's power. Are we ashamed of the gospel? Do we believe the gospel by itself won't convert? Someone well, says, but we used to meet in those little tacky white frame buildings on the other side of the tracks. Yeah, and we baptized about 10 times more people each year too, didn't we? Remember the story of the woman being shown through the ornate cathedral in Washington, D.C. by the White House? After they'd given her a two or three hour tour, she said to the fellow, this is a beautiful building, but how many souls have you won here this year? That's the bottom line. But now on the other, you're going to have to admit, when we come right down to the final statement, a lot of it has to do with judgment. But I would hate to be in the judgment-making, decision-making business and uh, opt for the use of the Lord's money from a prideful, socially accepted viewpoint instead of... Uh, value of souls. We have, uh, not very far from here, a congregation has been spotlighted uh, all over the Southwest recently because of the tail wagging the dog and some people investing their life's earnings in physical facilities and all that's gone down the drain. Could that be an object lesson to awaken us to the imbalance of thinking and spending. I've spent about 10 years of my preaching career meeting in rented halls, and not one single time have I thought that was a deterrent to spreading the gospel. I never met a single person that would not obey the gospel sincerely because of where we met. I've met some socially prominent people who wouldn't come there, but they weren't good seed for the kingdom anyway. If they're not touched by the death of Christ and the power of the gospel, we don't, we dare not uh, subject ourselves to any other approach. Think about it and we'll have some more questions. Remember the question box up there in the corner, or hand them to me personally. We have some great ones that they asked me not to answer tonight because they wouldn't be here. But we've got some good ones. You're listening to the radio work of the Gospel Broadcasting Network, and we would like to invite you to visit our website www.gbntv.org forward slash radio. Hi, I'm David Smith, and this is In a Word. In a long list of Bible words, if you had to pick 10 words to study, it's likely that you would not just simply go to the Scripture and pull out the word virgin. But I'm going to suggest that our word for today, virgin, is a significant word because everything that we believe regarding Jesus and His fulfillment of prophecy rests on on that word. In Matthew 1 23, the Bible says, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. And you may be able to go back in your tools and look at the original word that's used there, but that's for some a questionable word. 
You know, there are some modernists and infidels and skeptics who could read Matthew 1.23 and they say where Matthew writes and says, Behold, a virgin shall be with child. And they would say, yeah, you know, the, he translates that and uses the word virgin there. But it probably really doesn't mean an actual virgin. And I'm sorry to say, there are even some within the body of Christ who even make the claim that Mary was a sexually questionable woman, as if to say that perhaps she wasn't really a woman who had never known a man. But I think that's why this is such an interesting word, because the word virgin that Matthew uses here means a woman who has never known a man. Their claim, again, is that Mary was just a young woman. And they go back to Isaiah 7, 14 and say, well, the word that's used in Isaiah 7, 14, which Matthew is quoting in Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, means just a young woman. But this is interesting. Did you know that there are actually two words in the original language for virgin in the Hebrew language? And there could have been more to signify the same, but two primary words. One means specifically, exclusively, uh, a, a woman who has never known a man. The other can refer to a young woman or also to a virgin. Uh, for example, in Genesis 24, verse 16, it speaks of the virgin there, and that second word that could be used either way means uh, a virgin as well. In, in Isaiah 7, 14, where Isaiah is writing and says, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear son, and shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted as God with us, he uses the word that exclusively means a woman who has never known a man. Now, to get around the force of that, they say, well, probably under consideration there, they're just really talking about the wife of Ahaz. But that couldn't be the case. Because when you look at Isaiah 7 and you go back to verse 3, Isaiah had a wife and they had a son. So it couldn't be that he's referring to a woman who's never known a man. He is really actually literally talking about a woman who was going to have a son without the assistance, without the help of a man to show that it is a, indeed a miraculous conception. So, going backward into the text, Genesis 3, verse 15. Do you remember there it says, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. And there we learn that the woman was going to have a child, the implication of which is without a man. So you go back to Matthew 1. You look at verse 23 and following. You even begin the chapter, Matthew 1, 1, where you have the, the book of the generations of Jesus Christ, who is the son of David and the son of Abraham, both of those men to show that he is the fulfillment of Genesis 3, 15. But how about verse 20? Joseph was told that that which was in Mary was conceived not of him, but of the Holy Spirit. Miraculous conception, virgin conception. Then in verse 23, he uses the word that is connecting to Isaiah 7, 14 to show that virgin there means a woman who has never known a man. How about verse 23? He is Emmanuel, God with us. How else could it be except virgin conception, miraculous conception? And interesting, down in Matthew chapter 1, verse 25, the text tells us that Joseph did not know, that is to sexually know his wife, until after the birth of Jesus, showing us that it was indeed the conception of one who had never known a man. Now, I know some people say, well... You know, virgin conception, it doesn't really matter. Listen, it matters greatly. Because were he not born of a virgin, were he not born of one who had never known a man, not a single other prophecy would matter if he fulfilled it. It is a fulfillment in a long line of fulfillments of the Christ. I encourage you, study that word, and you'll be impressed by the fulfillment of Bible prophecy, even by the use of one word, virgin, in the text. That's been our word for the day. I'm David Smith, and this is In A Word. May I talk to you about a better life? Can you imagine how horrible hell will be? I dare say our minds just cannot possibly grasp, even though God in His Holy Word has defined it in very detailed terms, a place of outer darkness, a lake of fire and brimstone, everlasting punishment, things that should really grab our attention. I was 16 years of age. My first car was a 57 Chevrolet. Had a six-cylinder engine in it. I was changing the spark plugs one afternoon and my arm touched the hot manifold. I was foolish. I pulled my arm back suddenly, but part of the flesh stayed on the hot manifold. It hurt 
It did not hurt just for a few moments. It hurt and it kept hurting for hours. The burn, the hurt, the pain. And yet that was just one small portion of my body. The Bible tells us that there will be gnashing of teeth, weeping and wailing, hurting in this lake of fire and brimstone. Do we want the best life now? And certainly the best life after life on earth is over? There's only two alternatives, heaven and hell. Heaven in all of its glory and wonders. Hell in all of its horror. If we understand how horrible hell is, we will strive to avoid it at all cost. Whatever we must do. And if we understand how wonderful heaven is, we'll work and serve Screen and record. labor Selected. and person. Selected. Focus. Do not disturb. Button. Selected. Screen recording. Button.